As lockdown and social distancing continues, so does our special lockdown series. Once again, we're collaborating with our talented friends, YouTubers, and our favorite architects and designers to bring you episode three of Small Living. In this episode, artist and maker Cristiana of Get Hands Dirty in Portugal teaches us how to design and build our own furniture using simple tools. Jason from Plant Society returns to show us how best to take care of our plants at home. Our London contributor Celeste chats to award-winning artist and designer Nina Tolstrup of Studio Mama and answers some of our audience questions. While at home and nearby, please take care of yourself, your loved ones and your community. First up, interior designer Manuela Milan of Meanwhile in Melbourne shows us how to improve our workspaces while we're staying at home. Hi, my name is Manuela Milan. I am an interior designer and I run Meanwhile in Melbourne, a curated design blog and Instagram. And I am here to share a few of my favorite styling tips for your tiny home. Many people are now working from home and looking for inspiration to set up a home office. So I'm going to give you a few tips to set up and improve your workspace. The first step is finding the right space to set up your desk. I'm lucky enough to have a study area in my tiny apartment that I could convert into a home office. Next, you need to clear everything away. It's always best to start with a blank canvas. Think about what you use daily and what you only need occasionally so that you keep your workspace uncluttered. I only use a few stationary items and the rest I packed away. They're taking up valuable desk real estate. There are a ton of storage options that can look good as well as being functional. And you'll be surprised by how much a clear desk can improve your productivity and enjoyment. Shelving is a great way to create more space for your home office desk. There are lots of options out there to suit your specific setup. Don't forget to neaten up your cables with a cable organizer and a cable box. Lighting is also crucial to your workspace, so pay attention to that. I don't have a window near my workspace, so I brought in a lamp. A lamp can be functional as a task light and also can help to create a cozy atmosphere. There's always room for personal touches in the space you inhabit the most. Something that makes the space your own. Objects like art, photos, plants or flowers are perfect. And don't forget your favourite office cup. Grouping and layering objects also adds visual interest. Ergonomics are vital and often overlooked in home offices. You spend long hours sitting in front of the computer. So having a good chair like this Herman Miller one that protects your back and neck will be a worthwhile investment. If you don't have a separate space for a home office, make sure your setup can be easily packed away at the end of each day, so you don't feel like you're living in your office. A dedicated box would be very handy for this. So I really hope you enjoyed this video and please follow my design blog and Instagram account Meanwhile in Melbourne for one-on-one -on -one interviews and upcoming events and an evolving directory of Melbourne designers and makers. Hi, I'm Cristina Felgueiras and I'm the artist and maker behind Get Hand Story channel. I live in Porto, Portugal and build a lot of things with my own hands. Today I'm sharing with you how I made this outdoor chair that anyone can make with just a few tools. I made a paper template that is available for you to download in the description below so you can bring it home and put together just like I'm doing here. I traced the parts over the wood and here I was using pine that is a very easy to find type of wood because it was all I had on hand but I encourage you to safely get a better suitable wood for outdoor use if you can. After tracing two pieces of each and keeping them identified, we can proceed into cutting them. 
There are several ways you can make these cuts, but the most accessible for anyone would be using a jigsaw. You will need a few clamps to keep your wood from moving around and take a moment to predict your cut sequence. If you decide to cut along this line first, this whole part will fall off and then it would be harder to hold a smaller piece. Also make sure to avoid knots and wood imperfections as they might compromise the integrity of the chair. Don't forget that it will need to hold your weight. Take your time following the outer side of the line and use a proper and sharp blade to make the process more enjoyable. Now let's refine the shapes and make them as straight as we can, keeping the template size and angles. If you have a sander this might be a lot easier, but a board with coarse sandpaper spray glued to it can work well. Also you get to shake that body and move those sleepy muscles. To join the parts together we'll be using dowels and we better make a quick and simple jig. You just need some scraps of wood and if you use a hardwood it will work best. Then you attach two scrap pieces together that you know having a perfect 90 degree angle on one side. Get a wood drill bit that has the same diameter of your dowels and drill a hole into the hardwood scrap doing your best to keep the bit flush against that reference corner. You will need to attach another piece of wood that can be thinner and drill a large hole right where it meets the center line of the little block. We will use this reference line to bump against the pencil marks on your chair pieces to drill the holes for the dowels in the perfect spot. We need to make some marks on specific measurements that I will have pointed out on the template. After figuring out the layout for the dowels, you can go ahead and trace line segments that are perpendicular to the meeting edges. So we can grab our jig, match the pencil lines, secure it in place and drill. I put a little bit of green masking tape to create a visual depth stop. After checking for fit, we can start gluing the parts together. Please note that the glue will take some space and might difficult the assembly when things get too tight, so you can always enlarge the holes just slightly or sand the dowels just a tiny bit. Also be sure to use a wood glue meant for outdoor use that is waterproof. You need a couple of clamps to make sure the pieces are firmly pressed together. We'll repeat the procedure for the legs assembly and it might be a good idea to use a longer and thicker dowel to create extra strength since your body weight will be forcing this joint. To clamp such an open angle I quickly cut two clamping blocks that are also included in the template in case you need them. These will assist on closing the gap. When the glue is dry, I scraped off the glue squeeze out and sanded everything smooth with a palm sander. Now it's time to grab the template pieces and mark the place to drill a few holes. I started by drilling larger holes to later plug with some dowel rod and have all the screw heads hidden. Here we have the components for the chair. Two leg assemblies, two side assemblies, two sitting boards and two backing boards. You will also need a support piece where the seat will rest upon. If you don't have a workbench vise, this might be the time to reach out for a helper to hold the pieces securely while you drive in the screws. The gap between the boards doesn't have any particular size, it's up to you. I just used a scrap piece and made that dimension consistent for all the gaps. Once you have both parts assembled, it's time to connect them with some special nuts and a stainless steel threaded rod. You can easily cut the rod to size with an axe saw and thread it into the nuts. We still need to attach the support piece and you can call for your helper again or use your portable drill like I did here. All you need is to find the perfect spot where the feet sit flat and trace a line on the inside of the front legs. Now you know where to place the support piece, at what angle and can now drive the screws. We can finally fill in the screw holes with wood plugs, making everything nice and flush. It's probably a good idea to round over some sharp corners and it's ready to receive the finish. Make sure you use something durable and meant for exterior use. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this project, if you're interested in more videos like this please visit my channel and go get your hands dirty! If you're wanting to incorporate hardy plants for outdoor spaces, especially in an urban scenario, um, you want to incorporate plants that can withstand those conditions. So, here we've got a selection of hardy plants. Um, the first one I always go to is rosemary. 
Um, you can get it in a cascading form, but also an upright form. Um, the added advantage is you can cook with it. We've got succulents and cacti, which are used to harsh environments in the desert, which makes them perfect for windy balconies um, and exposed courtyards and terraces. The next two are in the ficus family. Um, they are more exotic, but they have a range of different types with different leaf forms. So if you are after something taller that can cope with the wind, um, there's ficus ali with a thin leaf form, or we've got the common uh, ficus elastica, which we see indoors, but they can cope outdoors as well. When it comes to styling in your house, um, don't be afraid to use materials that really speak your personality. Try to steer away from trends and try to, you know, where you can shop locally so that the materials and the palette is more you than mass produced. The key of styling is to think about texture, colour and form. So when you're looking at um, a simple pot like this, it might be nice to incorporate a plant that has more texture rather than another simple plant. So that's how we get away with making a space not feel too cluttered. Similarly here, you've got the form of the pot, but you've got a really textured ripsalis on top. We're keeping it quite low in some instances when it comes to dining tables, benches, where you want to be able to look across and not obscure that view. Whereas you start looking at bigger pots and planters like this, we're doing another simple pot here in a white, just because we've got a really nice um, dark foliage, which you want to accentuate. So in all instances you choose what is going to be the hero, it's either the pot or the plant. Um, so if the pot is something you want to highlight, then um, in this instance, then you'd let the pot speak rather than the plant itself, so you choose a simpler plant. Um, here is a good instance of the pot being louder than the plant and you want to celebrate the pot and not cover it with a draping plant but have something that grows upright. So there are instances of when you look at one-on-one -on -one styling with the plant and pot, but when you're thinking about clusters, you also want the clusters to speak together. So you don't want the clusters to feel ad hoc, and that's where you might use a whole lot of neutrals as the backdrop, and then one that has colour to become the highlight in that collection. So if you look at this collection, um, this pot here stands out, whereas these are almost the backup dancers, um, we always say when we're doing commercial styling. Um, and then in this instance, you might not have a cluster that might just sit on its own and really anchor a dining table, for instance. Don't be afraid to style and really play around. So um, you don't want to limit yourself and you don't want to just copy off magazines. You want to start um, experimenting yourself. So you can start switching plants and seeing what works and what doesn't. Don't be afraid to just give it a go. I always want people to give it a go at home. And hopefully today we've inspired you to use a range of materials and also to shop locally, but also have things that become a backdrop as well. Thanks for tuning in to learn more about greenery within your home. If you are after more information, head to our website. It's www.theplantsociety.com.au. London-based Nina Tolstrup is the co-founder of multidisciplinary design studio, Studio Mama. Nina has a rich and varied list of experiences spanning marketing, design management, photography and industrial design. Hi Nina, how are you? Hi, yeah, good, thank you. Um, tell us a bit more about your background. How long have you been working as a designer? I started Studio Mama in 2000, but I had a various careers of a lot of other things uh, before and I was at the time in my I mean mid-twenties. I went to Paris and studied uh, industrial design then went into doing trend forecasting and um, and just was slipping into doing more creative work and then I went my husband in Amsterdam and then we moved to London and that was when I started Studio Mama. And I think that's probably reflects a bit the Studio Mama's work because it's quite eclectic, a bit all over the place. You know, I, I like any new challenge. So we are not very kind of specialized in one area of, of design. Um, for me, it's whether I do interior architecture, industrial design or, or product design, exhibition design. It's, it's all kind of part of the same design process. Tell us about your design principles. What values do, your, do you bring to your work and to your spaces? 
Studio Mama has always, since we started, been about sustainable approach, which of course these days is so obvious. And <laughs> But when we started in 2000, for us, I mean, as designers, it was an area we had very little knowledge, you know, about. Of course, the world is very different now and we have a lot of uh, tools and knowledge and insight and extremely uh, committed companies. And so that's been something of values that has always been very core value for, for Studio Mama. Apart from that, I mean, we always had a very playful approach. That's not something that um, deliberate or thought out. It's just how, how it ends up being, you know. Like very often that people always think that, uh, that there's a lot of Scandinavian influence in my design. And of course, that's in my, my DNA. So for sure, that's uh, very much also part of uh, our um, design language. So when designing a space, what areas do you begin with and how does this influence the design process? We always begin with making a narrative about the experience and the feel of uh, a space and what you want to achieve. Like with a 13 square meter house, which is so tiny anyway, but you walk kind of through a little hallway where there's kind of storage. And then all of a sudden, even this tiny space, is, wow, you know, of course you are let through something that is a bit more confined. What is a small space doesn't necessarily feel that small, you know. We do like to work with color, and I think it's it's um, it's nice that it's not monochrome. But then, at the same time, space is very small; it can be quite overwhelming. So, with the uh, the thirteen square meter house, we work very much with pastel colors, but it's not overwhelming. Some of the things that we have found that works works very very well is obviously to look at the lighting. Daylight, outdoor light is key, you know, and of course there's many different ways of doing it. Existing windows, can you make the windows bigger, skylights. In a little townhouse, what we did there was um, lifting the roof half a meter, which isn't that much because uh, there's, I mean, planning restrictions and, and the height of neighboring houses that I couldn't get another floor in. But that was just worth it because it gave that kind of height so I could get a mezzanine in but it also gave the space double height so it feels quite generous and unexpected when you work up walk up that you have this kind of nearly double height uh, in in this small footprint and then of course putting in a new roof we had a big skylight that made it flood in with, with light we use a lot of reflection with mirrors that can use to kind of uh, give a sense of both expanding the space visually but also in terms of bouncing light about. How can we make apartment living and urban living feel more personal, more, I guess, stylish, um, but how can we do it affordably? I work a lot with what, I mean, reimagining. I call all my zero reimagined furniture, but it was all about... Uh, upcycling, reuse, reupholstering, reconfiguring. I mean, a great way to do things affordable and make it individual. You know, living in London, I mean, you can take an evening walk and you can probably pick up enough to make a whole uh, living room out of uh, <laughs> a found, found object. I mean, rethink things uh, in, in, in a fun way. So merging two broken things into one full thing and things like that, I think is very much great fun and the way forward. And I think we will see that a lot, lot more in the future. Why is sustainability so important in urban centers and living in smaller spaces? I think it's generally important. I don't think it has to particularly with being urban. I would never, I mean, start a site or a new project without zooming through everything that's there. What can we reuse? What can we put back? Is this faster and more economic to buy new materials? But it, you would get often nicer bricks or, you know, wood that's as, as good, you know, to, to reuse. We have abundance of materials uh, around us and this throwing away culture is probably not so uh, sustainable in the future. So I think it's, uh, for many good reasons, uh, a way that we have to approach. Thank you so much for your time and for speaking with us today. Great, you're welcome. Have a Thank nice you. day. Next episode, we'll speak to Shul Kleitmans from Here in Five in Amsterdam and share some more ideas for your time at home. 
subscribe to the channel and click the bell to receive updates on our next episode. For more detail on the features within Small Living, go to www.nevertosmall.com. Oh,